Hello, everyone. Let me get this started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to CSM Mastermind. My name is Andrew Marks. I am the co-founder of Success Hacker and of our Success Coaching Training Program. We are back today for our monthly live webcast, today focused on churn analysis and management. This free learning event is brought to you by Success Coaching, the world leader in customer success professional development training with more than 5,000 graduates globally. Our popular virtual boot camps run monthly. We offer 12-week coaching cohorts three times a year, an accredited online learning-based multi-level CSM certification program, that was a mouthful, and a number of standalone courses all taught by industry experts. Upcoming in this first half of 2021, we've got our level five of our CSM certification coming out along with a number of live virtual programs, including change management for customer success and to kick off our new management track, What Great Managers Do. You can find out more about our training programs at successcoaching.co. Now, for those of you that are new to this series, this is a live and unscripted discussion where we dig into a single topic relevant to customer success. This here right now is the only script that I follow during the t- our time together. We aim to pick topics that are going to be practical and useful and interesting to you. So I encourage you to suggest topics and our panelists for our learning events. Reach out and connect with me on LinkedIn and drop me a note. If you want to be on this and you've got something that you want to talk about, something that you're passionate about, please reach out to me. I'm always looking for, for, for guests. We run these every month. The schedule for our upcoming events can be found at successcoaching.co. Ashley will drop that in the chat window as well. You want to scroll to the bottom of the page and click on that events link to find out more. We will post a replay of this webinar with a transcription early next week on our website, as we do with all of these events. Now, there's a lot of thought leadership out there, along with a lot of theories about how to deliver customer success. The Mastermind Series allows us to focus on the practical and give you real-world advice, best practices, techniques, and shared experiences from those out in the wild practicing customer success daily. And to do that, we invite three panelists to join me for a roundtable discussion. These are people who are great at their craft, and we ask them to share their experiences and their perspectives. Now, this, this learning event is for you, and we will be taking questions, so get ready to use that Q&A functionality at the bottom of your Zoom window to ask or upvote a question. Also, we have enabled the chat function. So please use chat for for, for commentary. Without further ado, I'd like our panelists to introduce themselves to y'all, talk a bit about who they are and what they do. So let's get started in alphabetical order with Chad. Chad, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. Hey, everyone. My name is Chad Hornfeld. I'm the Director of Customer Success at Customer with a K. So Customer is a support platform CRM, and we serve a whole bunch of different industries a lot in the direct-to-consumer space, uh, but again, all sorts of different uh, industries. And our main focus is providing an amazing customer experience for our customers' customers. And my role here as a director of customer success is focusing really specifically on the customer success area. So we have a team of customer success managers, as well as technical account managers. And I work within our greater customer experience team. So we have a professional services team, as well as a support team. And I've been in this customer success space for many years and very passionate about customer success. Excellent. Thanks, Chad. Kelly, you're up. Hey, everyone. I'm Kelly Hook. I most recently for the past two years was a head of customer success for a supply chain software company in the Bay Area. Uh, built that team from scratch as we as we grew and did the, the startup rocket ship journey. Uh, we also had support and uh, technical onboarding. So excited to talk about that. I did just recently join last week a, a new company called On Deck, and we are uh, launching a customer success program there that's a, a small executive community. Thanks, Kelly. And, and I appreciate the, uh, the invite to speak to that community. Yes, I'm very excited to have Andrew. Involved in that, for sure. And last but not least, Laura. Hello, everyone. I am Laura Loquara. It's great to meet you all and have you join today. Um, I have 13 years of client management experience, but most recently built customer success from the ground up for SoftBank Robotics. So I am a career changer. And so I love this conversation around churn and excited for today's uh, topic because I've seen a lot of different things around client management. But the last three years, I'm going to be really focusing on the uh, top, topics at hand for that time. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, when I first met Laura, 
she said that she worked for a robot company. I was like, oh, wow, <laughs> cool. Let's talk about robots and customer success. That sounds like really interesting uh, work. So once again, we all appreciate your time, all my guests. So let's get to the topic at hand, churn. Right? Why, why do we have to be concerned about churn? Can we just fill that lost revenue with, with, with new revenue? Isn't that what the sales team is here for? Uh, of course, I see that tongue in cheek. Uh, and, and I think we all know one of the best ways to manage churn is through appropriate expectation setting, well thought of, a well thought out approach for helping our customers achieve value, yada, yada, yada. Right. But, but I think we'd also like to hear more about some of the ways in which you monitor the risk of churn and what you do to learn from that and convey that back to your organization. Who wants to get us started? Sure. I'll, I'll jump in. So we do a number of different things here to monitor churn risk and to make sure that we have good understanding of where our customers are. So a few things that we do here, we do things like voice of customer surveys, where we ask a lot of in-depth questions. We even ask our questions, you know, or ask our customers, what is your, uh, you know, what's your willingness to renew with us to some degree? And, and then we ask them to kind of rate that. We also look at things like engagement. So are they engaging with our support team? Are they engaging with our customer success team? Are they engaging with our marketing communications that we're sending? And then lastly, we look at things uh, such as usage. So how are they using our product? Not, not necessarily are they logging in, but more so are they using key components of our product that will make sure that they're getting value out of our product? So those are some of the things that we look at today. And you know, in terms of that sophistication, in terms of how we bring that data together, we're still working through that, but at least we have some of that data today. I could add a little bit on, onto that as well. Um, so my last company, we were trying to be very scrappy about the way we, we use tools to monitor at first. So we, we got Tableau and we built out our own custom dashboards, uh, looking at things like for supply chain for us, transaction volume uh, was a big one, uh, support tickets as well. Uh, time to reach certain milestones. So if they hadn't hit milestones in onboarding by a certain stage, that was a risk. Um, if they were taking too long, it, it meant the, they weren't having a sticky enough experience perhaps. So we wanted to get on the phone with them, make sure we understood what was happening and, and how to prevent it. And I'll also add one thing that I learned early on was uh, when reporting churn up, up to the leadership and to the, uh, we had the Andreessen Horowitz board, uh, we, we reported uh, net MRR. So I'm curious if other people use that one versus gross MRR or, or whatever. But um, net MRR is the percentage change uh, in MRR due to like expansions, cancellations, and downgrades. And you're looking for a negative MRR churn rate because that means that your company is actually growing faster than you're losing customers. Right. So it's, it's nice to keep that in mind uh, because if you do have a couple customers churn, but you're still getting a, a good number of sales or other accounts are expanding, then overall your net MRR churn rate can still look pretty good. Kelly, to add in on that and Chad, um, I think the key thing for us is just to expand this is how are you driving those analytics? And I think Kelly and Chad both touched on this is that once you identify the trends, the behaviors, I went through the entire life cycle of launching a product where we needed all this data to understand what the behavior was going to be of our customers. And once you get those um, trend lines for adoption, engagement, um, and what basically rolls up to a health score, you can start breaking them into categories of what you might consider a red, red, yellow, green, add in maybe in between colors there. But the goal is to have a forecast. And yes. one of the things, Kelly, I really liked what you said is about uh, the concept of a timeline. And I called it the timeline of value. And that's a pretty popular phrase. Is that something we drove a lot across senior leadership and got it packaged to a six week? So all of a sudden, if you have something that says, okay, this customer is getting off on value, and it could be any of those key p those key components, then you're having a forcing function because this goes beyond just onboarding. It's how do you get to that ROI piece for your customers? Yeah, like, oh, oh, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead Jack. Go ahead. I was going to say, like, I was going to jump into what something that Laura mentioned earlier in terms of packaging all that information up. And I know there's a question that came in here in terms of, you know, using Gainsight and other systems. So right now, you know, we're not, we're, we're in the midst of implementing a system, but we don't have that system in place. And I think that going back to Kelly, something you mentioned around being scrappy, 
That's actually one of our values, but it's scrappy with a K because of you know, customer with a K. Of course. But it's it's really it's it's you need to be you know scrappy because you need to have that forecast. So whether you can pull that data together in one system or you can you 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 have to pull that forecast together. So at the moment, you know, when I first started, there was we didn't really have anything. And so I just started with a simple green, yellow, red and had the CSMs manually update that, and which is not great, um, but it's a starting point. And so you can start to get the executive team on a cadence of regularly showing what the, the yellows are, what the reds are, why they're yellow and red, and mm-hmm. getting the company rallied around what might turn a customer going down that wrong path towards that churn. And I think that those are some of the things that, you know, as a leader, you really need to start to work through that. And then you can hopefully get everyone else aligned on how to prevent some of that churn from happening. But you have to start to track it. And then you have to start to track, you know, what are those at-risk factors? Yeah. And that's, that's, that's key, right? We need to track what it, what's happening. We need to identify the variables that play into it occurring and then, you know, and, and where a lot of companies uh, that, 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 that I've worked with and that I've worked for, unfortunately, um, ha- have failed to do is, okay, now, now that we know this stuff, how do we then change what we're doing, right? How do we incorporate that back into, uh, you know, uh, into, into product and, 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 and some of the gaps that there, there are that are causing people to, to churn or into sales or marketing because the misset expectations, uh, you know, one of the, one of the best things that you can do to, to grease the skids of a churn is to have uh, a bad handoff between sales and post sales or misset expectations. Uh, and, and so, you know, what have you, you know, what have you done to effectively feed that type of information back into your organization? Well, I think, Andrew, one of the questions that came in is, is really appropriate for that, which is about handling postmortem for customers that churn, because this is one way to get feedback on, you know, are your assumptions accurate about why customers are churning? And it, it reminds me because one of the things probably that we heard most recurring was that the expectations set in the sales cycle were not exactly what was delivered, right? And, and as a startup, I mean, we were also going through some major growing pains about identifying the right customer profile from the beginning. Um, you know, at first we were wanting to be the tool for everybody. And then slowly we realized exactly what's the, the customer that's most successful, who can get through onboarding most quickly, start funneling that back into the sales team. So really looking at the partnership between sales and CS and, and of course, product is as a cohesive unit and, you know, recognizing at least for for everyone that's in a startup, like it's not going to be a perfect science. And as you kind of hone your ideal customer profile, you learn from the people that leave um, and try to have, you know, the questions about how do you structure postmortems or or how do you handle them? Um, Trying to have with, as soon as somebody tells you they're leaving or ideally you knew in advance, but if not, you know, you find out, you're able to get them on the phone for an interview, a short one. Um, And it's really, hopefully you have a a bit of a relationship there if your uh, number of customers is small enough to allow that. Um, And for us, you know, we would ask four or five questions, uh, things like if, you know, if there was something different that we could have done from the start to have you stay, what would that have been? Um, Or, you know, what are some examples of, of moments where you felt like, support maybe wasn't effective, uh, that, that type of stuff. So trying to really hone in on what the problem was. And oftentimes you'll get people just being like, ah, you know, just, just wasn't a fit, you know, they, they won't be as honest as you'd like, but a lot of times you'll get really specific feedback. Um, and then you can route that back into what makes the ideal customer for your company. Yeah. I was going to say, I think one of the challenges you have when you do that post-mortem is that, especially if you still have a relationship with them, mm-hmm is oh i i still have a relationship with kelly i don't want to yeah i'm not going to i'm not going to really you know open the kimono and tell her all of the the stuff that i didn't like because i want her to still like me right and that's just kind of this this just this this well, maybe she doesn't maybe she doesn't like right? you 
And maybe, maybe she, she doesn't. doesn't like <laughs> I'm no, going to jump my... in. Most of our clients typically had no problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Opening, okay. Um, the floodgates of what they wanted. And I don't know about the rest of you, but um, Chad, I would agree with that. Mm. Um, and I think those that are willing to get on the phone with you still have the engagement the support of you and that partnership angle. And the one thing I just wanted to add is who can partner with you. I had senior leadership for it, and I'm super grateful for this, that go to market supported our efforts in research, interviewing and presenting the findings because customer success has high expectations. It has the KPIs on churn, but I argue that KPIs for churn obviously should have components for product teams, sales teams. Company. It should be cross-functional, company but you. oftentimes it's not set up that way. So who's going to be that that co-leader with you to present the fightings and actually come up with action plans and see those through because I think sometimes CS is caught in being able to achieve all of that. Well, and that's the thing, people. There's too many companies look at customer success. Too many, too many uh, leaders look at customer success as you're the everything team, right? But I, I would say, Andrew, like one of the things that customer success can fall down on themselves is regarding like just taking one one or two examples and say, oh, well, this client didn't get this product feature or this client was missold. And really what you need to do, and this is kind of how you level up, is that you look at the trends. Like, you you, you know, you, you look, is there is there a pattern here or is this right. just a one-off? Right. And if you, and, and that's why it's really important that you start, you track, what are the clients that churned over time? You look at the different segments of so what segment are they in? Right. Uh, are they in a particular industry? Right. You can even narrow down, like, is this a particular salesperson right. that sold these particular accounts and when did they sell them? Was it at the end of the year when they're trying to make their number or something to that effect? Like yeah. you really need to look at those trends and be communicating them on a regular basis. So one of the things that, that we do here at Customer, which is something that uh, I really enjoy, and it's going um, with meeting with our executives, certain executives, not all of them, but most of them, uh, and having a monthly meeting where we go through um, what is at risk? Why is it at risk? What are the trends? And then where do we need help? And we've had a lot of really interesting things that have come out of that. So one thing that came out of it was, you know, we work with product and we, um, you know, have certain features that we put forward and we're like, hey, can you prioritize these? And then they would prioritize them and then they would like push them out for other things that, you know, just came up. And that of course happens, right? You only have a, a certain amount of resources. So we put this, what we call a feature commit in place where it's a specific form that we fill out. There's a specific reason that we need this feature. Uh, we have to, you know, justify it, and uh, I I approve it. So my team will bring them forward, and then we discuss the feature commit with the product team, and we try and negotiate a date. And then we obviously work with the client on that. But those are some things that we've done that have come out of some of these discussions where we just needed a feature and we just weren't able to deliver it, let's say, within the time frame. Um, so having those trends and reviewing them is really helpful. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, it, 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 communication, right? It's all about communication, right? We, we need to take we need to take what we learn from churn and we need to communicate back to the teams that need to hear, right? And this is, I was just talking about this with a team that I, I, I finished a, a three-day boot camp with today. Uh, we talked about how important it is that you're not framing this as we're coming to, to slap your, your hand because you did something wrong. We're bringing this to your attention because we want to educate you we want you to help you understand that when we get put in these positions where you've oversold something, where you've, where you've, uh, um, you've misset expectations, it takes a lot more effort for us to try and get that customer back on track. And there's no guarantee that they will ever get back on track. And what that does is it takes that time that we have now had to spend in that situation and we're not able to spend it on our customers that are in a good shape, mm -hmm. that we could be getting much bigger upside. And it's an incredibly selfish thing uh, to do to not recognize this and do something about it because it affects the entire company. It does. Yeah, one of the things that we, we've done there, I'd say really well, is, is just reviewing you know, those customers, obviously, that are wrong fits and the impact on the team. I think the other things that we've done well are in terms of how we incentivize 
our sales team. So they're incentivized based on uh, like a few things. One is if new seats are added after in that first year after the initial sale, they're comped on that. And so that way, you know, they, they don't need to you know, squeeze everything out in the beginning. Um, and they also stay invested in, in, in the relationship after that initial deal is sold. So there's some complications. I don't know if it's on invoicing or something like that. We can get help from the sales team. So I think that's important, especially sometimes there's a bit of you know, rough patches in that initial stage yeah. in terms of expectation. Yeah. I think the other thing, like going back to the data, the other thing that was super successful that I did, because I think that when I look at it, when you're trying to convince executives, like you have to bring data. And so there's churn data, which is data. It's not great data. No one wants to talk about churn or bring churn. Hey, look, I've got churn. Um, it's never a good way to start. So, you know, using what I had mentioned, the voice of customer survey, that was really helpful because we we launched that. We, we actually had really structured data that we can bring forward. And it really pointed out some key areas that we needed to improve. And in fact, it, it actually changed the strategy in the company because it, it focused us on a specific product area and we doubled down. We actually took resources from different areas and improved that area. And the other thing is that we also found some customers that we didn't weren't aware that they were in trouble and it allowed us to focus on them. Hmm. Nice. Oh, I'm curious. Um, so it, the more, that was a very positive way that you guys helped incentivize the sales team, which is great. I've heard some uh, alternative examples where commission is removed if the customer churns within the first six months. We didn't try that, but that is something I, I've heard. We, we do that too. So we, we do okay. have the flip side of that too, yep. Yeah. Nice. Um, one, one thing that did work on our end is for customers that were going to reach a certain tier that were, you know, high, high value prospects. Our team had a solution architect, you know, type role that would sit in on the pre-sales side and make sure that expectations were aligned before the deal ever closed. So that, that was a huge uh, win once we started having that, uh, you know, type of involvement early on. And it's really, you know, not waiting until the deal closes to have this kickoff call where you're like, all right, what are you expecting to get out of our product? And, you know, why are you buying? Uh, that should really be pre-deal close, in, in my opinion, um, just to make sure everyone's on the same page and, and then close it. Of course, sales is like, well, that's going to take more time that, you know, it's a relationship you got to work out there. But in the end, everyone benefits. The one thing um, I wanted to jump in and add and discuss is just, um, I'm just totally blinking. <laughs> Andrew, ah. take, take over from me. I just had it, Kelly, but I got um, distracted. I'm so excited to hear this. <laughs> well, we had, a, we had a question come in about, um, about the survey around voice of the customer and Chad, I don't know if you are able to share some, some questions you guys use there. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, we send it to existing customers. We, do, we treat churn customers differently, similar to what you were saying, Kelly, we like call them up and try and get more information. So, so yeah, some of the questions that we'd ask, uh, for example, uh, how can we do, how can we be easier to work with? Um, we would ask the standard MPS question, and then we'd ask the, the simple, similar MPS question, but uh, across different areas of the business. So, you know, if you were to tell a friend or colleague, uh, you know, about the sales team, you know, how would you rate us about the billing team, about the support team, about the CSM team, about education and about marketing materials. And that way we can actually rate all the different areas. And the best question that I put in, and I love showing this, and this is how I, I would say I engage the CEO. You know, the question is, if you were you wanted to say something to the CEO, what would you say to them? And uh, it's really great. A lot of times there's, you know, some just really great information. Sometimes they'll say, Hey, you know, give the CSM a raise or something like that. And <laughs> so there's usually some really good yeah. quotes in there that I can share. And then what I do is I pick stuff out of that survey and I share it with the broader company. And that's all part of marketing your customer success team as well and making sure they know, you know, what you're doing. But what was really important about the survey is that it wasn't just customer success, even though I was the one that was pushing for it. I found out that, you know, we use Qualtrics in marketing. I was like, oh, I'm going to use that tool. And then I went to the product team and asked the product team, what questions would you like to ask? And then they partnered with, I partnered with marketing and product in terms of presenting to the whole company. And the product team was really happy, the product engineering team, because we asked questions, you know, around the, the product, is it easy to use? And, you know, is it, is it stable? And there was really good response there. There was obviously some negative parts of the product too, but there was things that they could rally around. And I think that's really important too, is that going back to our original point where customer success isn't 
to just the team. It's the, it's the company. Right. It's and the company. if you're doing these types of initiatives, it's, this is a way to bring everyone mm-hmm. together and working on your side. So it was a really powerful initiative and is something that I, I really recommend to help you, you know, leap, you know, over some of these hurdles that you might have because it just, you have that data that you can now bring to the company. And just, just around it that came back there. to me. Whoops, sorry, Laura. <laughs> Kelly, okay. really quick, I'm going to jump in. So yeah. it stays. Um, how do you celebrate and take the stigma from churn? How do we celebrate feedback and any time customers engage and provide us an NPS score, whether it's high or low, provide us product feedback. I have so many designers that I've worked with that would give anything for someone from a UX experience, from any portion of their engagement with the product that they would be appreciative of that and like that audience. And so I think there's a shift and way to celebrate and create it apart. I mean, I think failure and this fail fast concept definitely is prominent in the tech area um, and arena, but I think it has to be applied to churn and create a way that it's not looking to point fingers, but let's take action. Let's be the company that is driving great client results. And I think it has to be a cultural shift Versus it, versus it just feeling like a heavy weight when we lose bad customers. We've got to get rid of bad customers too. Yeah. You've got to get your ICP right and not have customers weighing down the teams. So um, Chad, thanks for uh, <laughs> bringing things back from my memory. But that's that's the key thing to me is that you want customers giving you this feedback. So let's celebrate it internally so that we can actually take action. I think that's, that's a great point. And it, it, it kind of reminds me here, the question that Jim had asked, it includes like, when you're sending that voice to the customer survey, is it also like NPS? And for us, we, we wrapped it all in one. We had 10 questions. One of those questions was, would you recommend our product? You know, that is the NPS question. Then we did the same thing Chad did with their team, which is uh, work with the product team to understand what are the top three, four questions you want to ask customers. And we make it super simple. You know, some of them are just, some of the answers are just scale one to five. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, exactly. you, not a lot of open-ended questions, like how fast can you do it? And we, we got such low response rate just sending that stuff over email. The best time we got responses would be like, you do a QBR, end of the QBR, or you're on the phone with someone, you're like, hey, by the way, we, we'd like to send you this survey. And they yeah. would almost always uh, respond to that survey just after talking to us versus like a cold email. That's one point. But to Laura's point, you know, when we'd get high scores or good feedback, one of the ways we would celebrate that internally is uh, basically turning into either a quote or, or sharing a quote at an all hands like talking about that internally at the company or bringing them, bringing them into a use case. So some of the questions we had are actually um, based on the, the initial, you know, what, what will make you successful? The questions that we'd normally ask, like pre-deal close or kickoff, we weave that into the, the survey because we know that's what we want to go to market saying that the customer is successful with. For instance, we, we want to, pr- at, at Orful Supply Chain Company, we wanted to prove that you know we were saving our customers at like 25% more than our competitors in money. And so we would try to get them to confirm on the survey, just like yes or no, uh, you know, did has orderful saved your team costs? Um, and then if they said yes, like I would usually follow up with them or or one of the team would to try to get them to actually quantify how much we've saved them so that we could use that in, in a use case and, and continue building them as an advocate. Nice. That's a good, that's, that's a nice strategy. And um, just answering a question here uh, from Brett that we would send it, we're, we're sending the survey out twice a year. So we'll see, I think that's sufficient. We also have an in-product MPS survey to get us a little bit of other data. And we're going to be testing out different types of ways that we can survey our customers after certain engagements they have with us, whether it's a you know business review or some other type of initiative. But Chad, did you send it out twice a year, like same date, or would you would you do it twice a year based on when they joined? Like c- customer joined, you'd send them yeah. in six months. It's a good question. So <laughs> it's based on this like a similar date, so that we can kind of gather all the data at once. But we also that's why I was going to saying we we also are experimenting with surveys based on when they go live or surveys after renewal. Like now that we're going to start to build in more of an orchestrated approach to our customer journey, uh, we can start to do some of these other types of surveys ongoing. So, so um, um, thank you. Can you, by the way, can you hit done on, on Brett's question? So these scroll up and can you do the same Kelly for Jim yep. Yep. as well? Uh, excellent. Thank you for the questions, by the way. 
Um, so, so here's, so what do you do though for the, you've got the, you've got the, uh, you've got the, um, the vocal minority. What do you do to deal with the silent majority? Right. The, the, those, those people who don't talk, who don't answer those surveys. Are you dealing, are you, think- are you just at usage? Are you looking just at, right? Well, maybe they just don't like, they don't like uh, giving you surveys. Uh, and then adding on to that before just before before uh, you, you answer, um, you know, well, let's let's start with that. Let's start with that. I think that goes into the total point of the CS role then is how are you creating engagement and high value? And if your customer is ignoring you, you're not creating the value that's required. And so to me, there's a lot of SaaS products and vendors that customers are using. Does it make sense for them to engage with you weekly? Does it make sense? What is the executive need to drive value from the product, have a story around ROI and have this be a piece of a broader picture? But I put that then in the hands of the customer success manager to be proactively reaching out, Mm -hmm. proactively sharing insights. I can't tell you how many times you know, data shared, data shared, and then maybe the fifth time around, you know, so often people are just overwhelmed right now with a lot of responsibilities. So I think that's how you do it. And you interview then I've had um, even CSMs us talk about just NPS scores within the interview so that we're just getting that data back as we're having those conversations. Chad? That's a great idea. Yeah. The other thing I was going to say is one of the things we're focusing right now on is uh, evaluating the relationships that we have with our decision makers. So, you know, every, every company is different. I think what you need to really understand is what leads to churn or what leads to success with that particular client or your, your client base. And for us, that decision maker, it doesn't have to be an executive. It's, it's really usually at the manager level or director level. They're the ones who are going to determine whether they're going to stay with your solution and whether they're getting success with your solution. And it's so critical to make sure that you have a really good relationship, a strong relationship. So the exercise we did just recently is we did, we made sure, first of all, that we knew who the decision makers were on these key accounts. And you can't do this with all your segments. I mean, depending on you know your, your business, like we have very tiny customers and we have really large customers. So we are experimenting with a couple of our segments and you know we, we determine if it's a strong, neutral or weak relationship. And now we're gonna build a playbook on how we can strengthen those relationships and I think it's even more critical now that we're in this, I don't know, post-pandemic world where we're not going to visit our customers. We're not going to see them in person. And so you need to make sure that you're thinking about different types of programs that you can put in place to strengthen those relationships. So if they're not filling out their surveys, that's fine. Maybe you can engage them in different ways. And, and I was actually just you know, riffing with a, someone on a CSM on our team. And we were thinking about this idea of uh, bringing together two uh, decision makers who have who are strong have strong relationships with, with, with sorry strong relationships with us and two that are weak have weak relationships and seeing if we can start to engage them that way. And that actually uh, Jody has a has a question here. What are some creative ways to engage with customers that are potential churns or have low usage of your product? This year oh, has been unique due to COVID. So, uh, so any suggestions? Anything, any other ideas? Laura? We did success yeah. plans. Yeah. We did 30 day success plans and we reached out and I, I reached out directly with the CSM. So it was um, a leader and a, um, the direct owner of the account on the call and had just uh, very just direct conversations of you're not hitting the mark for the ROI that you expected and that you're expecting from us. I know you want us to solve this for you. How can we partner together? Because I can't ensure that your team provides that engagement, adopts, unless I get your top-down support. So we created an entire plan that had a deep set of details of what we're going to do weekly, what we're committing to on reporting and the ensurement of success with additional training. And now this is high-touch customers. So I do want to make sure these are a larger enterprise I'm speaking to. Um, for this type of engagement. But the goal was really to get that from um, uh, red to yellow and really change that around a red to green and make sure that, that by 30 days, they're back on track to the outcomes they expected. Well, so you're, 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 you're creating a success plan, which is essentially a get well plan, a remediation plan, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. But, but I also, you know, lack, 
like when I introduced the subject, the best way to, you know, one of the best ways to, uh, 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 to avoid churn uh, is, is to have a plan going out of the gate and establishing, exactly you know, using a success plan as, you know, to lay out, this is the direction we're going to go in. And that success plan has, have those quantifiable uh, success criteria, right? You've got a success criteria and you've got, you've got an actual, uh, a metric. Hey, you said you, were, you wanted to achieve X. And, and if you're doing your job as a customer success manager, you should be making sure that we're tracking to that. And if they're not, right. The, 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 the best way to avoid churn is to be proactive and go, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Stakeholder, we're not tracking to your objective. Let's get this back on track. Yeah, I kind of I want to weave that into Eugene's question a little bit, which I love and is something we all struggle with, uh, essentially asking, um, you know, what are some tactics and strategies you use to convince the product team? that churn data should drive specific feature implementation. That, that, that's the question, uh, which I think is really interesting. One, I, I wouldn't focus so much on churn data, but um, this is like a business uh, assessment, right? So if, if there's customers that are, are churning or look like they might be at risk and you want to work with the product team to get some features on the roadmap that are currently not there, at least for our case, we always looked at that as, hey, these three customers make up X percentage of our company's revenue. Hmm. And uh, while it's great that we want to focus on these other things, like they're not happy and uh, we need to focus on them. That that would be an instance where you can clearly make the business line case. Make a case for it, right. Yeah, exactly. exactly. But And there are cases where you wouldn't win like that. And it was helpful for us as CSMs to also look at it and be like, whoa, you know, we've got some, some squeaky wheel customers who we still love, but they are a very small percentage of revenue. So we're going to let this go versus, uh, yeah, hey, our enterprise customer making up 30% of revenue here is uh, upset about something we need to shift. And that almost always worked, especially on the leadership level. Um, and then the other thing I would say is, focusing on what, what were the blockers to our company's greatest need. So for us, uh, that was onboarding speed. And if we could prove that anything was impacting onboarding speed in a negative way, it would shift the product roadmap because we, we needed like all hands on deck to get customers onboarded in a certain amount of time. And our, our team was the only one that was in product day in and day out, like, like a customer almost. So they, you know, they were seen over time as trusted experts in identifying areas of, of blockers. Um, and they would essentially prove like, we, we even had spreadsheets being like, it, we, we would do a, a weekly um, meeting with the product team, use a spreadsheet. And anytime we wanted to raise a feature request, we would include like how much time we in, in, estimated it impacted onboarding um, in addition to revenue and, and some other metrics. But I think those are the two biggest things, like frame it in a business context if you can, or like, how is this influencing, um, you know, some of your biggest pain points as a company? Right. Fast time to value, right? Fast time to value is important yeah. for you. So, okay. So fast well, time to value it, it might not be, the key variables, right? But, but Andrew, like I would say, maybe it's not like, uh, sometimes the problem is that there's just a misalignment between the functions and yeah. it sometimes it has to go up even higher to like the CEO, like who, you know, if, if, if product's main role is just pushing out product and it's not focused necessarily on the business you know, which is, sounds strange, but sometimes those there's, you know, companies, especially startups are growing so fast and there's, there's misalignment. And so it's really our jobs to make sure there's alignment. And if there isn't just call it out and say, Hey, like, what do I do here? Like these, you know, customers are churning. It's a significant customer. And I don't feel that I'm getting the necessary, you know, time. Uh, I think that the other thing that sometimes it's not really talked about, but it's really important is building those relationships with the other functions. So sometimes, you know, I will say to my team, like, listen, I know this customer is important, but I'm prioritizing this new feature over this other thing that we need for a customer because I feel that we have to. And so that's the other thing too, is that you sometimes you have to take your customer success hat off and you have to put your either product hat on or your company hat on and, and make some, some tougher decisions. But if you do that, that helps build the trust with the other function. So that, that's just something that it's not necessarily talked about a lot, but doing all these different things that helps build that relationship with the other groups. Well, you know, that's a great point. It's actually something that we trained. It's in our level two training. We talk about the importance of having to, having to uh, collaborate effectively with your team members, mm -hmm. right? In order for you to deliver effective customer success for your customers, you've got, everybody's got to work together. 
and 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 something that we in customer success everybody does every day that we should be applying to the internal organizations that we work with is employing empathy is understanding their perspective is 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 standing in their shoes and when you go and you are asking for things or you are pushing for things you also want to do that just like whenever you're communicating with a customer understand their perspective and make sure that you're 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 asking for the right things and your your narrative is appropriate right otherwise you're going to get pushed back right you're not going to get what you're what you're what you're trying to to get done and that hurts you and that hurts your customer that hurts your entire company Andrew, I think this ties in nicely with Florence's question. Did you find there was better adoption with the shorter timeline for the success plan? I find quarterly success plans have had really low adoption by the client. And the reason I want to tie this into the product is the onboarding and the timeline to value. You are, your clients losing money, the length it times for them to adopt and then get the value from that. So the expectation is, is you've got to shorten to that to a realistic time frame, um, and you've got to study what's, who's are the industry trends across the verticals, as well as the tiers of how fast they can adopt. And I think it's all about communicating that up front. I eventually created an SOW with my team for enterprise of this is what it's going to take to meet these milestones. This is how you're going to get to these six weeks. And let's sign off on this. Let's agree to this. These are the resources you're going to have to commit because once again, if you don't have that, that adoption definitely gets kicked off. The people that are, you know, other projects come up, other things, they have a lot on their plates and you've got to have that alignment of the users as well as the team enforcing that from top down. And that really comes from the handoff of sales, or maybe you're in those calls even before the close has happened at the, you know, towards the close and you're setting that expectation, but that should go into product conversations as well. What needs to have happen with product so it's not a big hurdle for fast adoption. Well, and I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little confused by, I mean, this terminology, quarterly success plan. A success plan is strategic, right? A success <laughs> plan, and a success plan is a living document. It's something that evolves over time, right? So. So my success plan right now may be, hey, we want to achieve our first milestone, which is that initial rollout. And if we can achieve that initial rollout in a month, then we need to make sure that we're documenting all of the steps that we need to take to move to that milestone and when it's going to happen and who's responsible for it, right? Mm -hmm. And whether the, and so if, if that's a, a one-month snapshot, great. And then once we've achieved that first time to value, then the success plan you know, may change after three months or six months, right? But let's not mistake a success plan with a project plan or a remediation plan because they're different things, right? The project plan is here are the steps that we're going to take to get you onboarded in three weeks, right? The success plan, though, is more strategic thinking. It's, it's higher level and it's something that you use to ensure that everybody's aligned from the key stakeholder down to the individual contributors and it drives accountability because people's names are on that thing and dates are on that thing. Yeah. No, I love that. Thanks, um, Lawrence. Just answering one of the questions here um, from Simon. Um, and this kind of ties into the success plan because you know if you're doing the success plan, you want to actually track their engagement and uh, how did that success plan actually contribute to the value the customer is getting. And so the, the, the Simon just mentions engagement in terms of key components in your product and sharing a little bit more about how you define and measure that. So this is interesting because it does tie into churn and tracking client health. So one of the things that I've done in the past is there's this, this concept of, um, uh, I forget the, the term, but it's basically looking for those customers that you're, are your best customers. Those are the ones that are doing really well, they're doing all the right things and they're being successful. And you want to try to understand, like, why are they successful? What are they doing? Right, and right. maybe they're using key areas of the product. Maybe they're interacting with your support team. And so if you start to understand who are your best customers and why are they your best customers, then you can kind of define those different parts that can, can make up part of your health score when it comes to the adoption part. So that's kind of how we came up with that. And, you know, similar to Kelly on the scrappiness, you know, there was someone who, uh, who came over in an acquisition that we made. And they're just really into data and just extremely 
strong in that area. And I leverage them to build something out in, in a spreadsheet that refreshes and it has these core areas. And that kind of became the, the, the core of our health score that we have, you know, out of a spreadsheet, but it, it works and um, it's not tied into everything, but at least it does something and gives us some better indicator than we had before. Exactly. It gives you more than you had before. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. If you can hit done on that. So uh, PT asks, and it's been upvoted a few times here, and Kelly looks like Kelly wants to jump in and, and uh, on this one first. But what can you recommend for a situation where the client is not engaging in implementation due to their internal t- turnover? My main contact has changed three times, and I've had to start the process over again with each new person that has come in. The third contact is now unresponsive, and not engaged at all in implementing supposedly due to other more important issues within their company, which they will not specify. Yeah, this is interesting. And I think everyone will probably have a a comment on this one. I can just intimately relate to this. Uh, This happened several times at at my previous company as well. And we we had a lot of internal dialogues about how to address it. Um, On the one hand, uh, it, it probably depends on how you get revenue yourself. Like for us, we would get revenue upfront. So their time, while we would prefer for it to go quickly so they get time to value all of that, like at a certain point, we allowed it to just go. You know, it's like, you know what? They they don't have the time right now. We're going to check in at this particular cadence, try not to annoy them, um, you know. But on the flip side, there was another situation where, um, you know, our main point of contact wasn't the buyer, right? The person who actually signed the contract is, is often different than the person who you're working with day to day. So if you're really not getting responsiveness over time, you have to be delicate here. You don't want to go around your point of contact, but you know, there, there is a situation where you you might want to check in with the person who signed and say like, these are what we agreed. um, You know, the the reason you bought our software, our service. And I'm just noticing that it's taking a long time to get to this particular milestone we agreed on. I know there's been some turnover. just want to check in you know, and make sure we're still on track here. If there's anything our team can do to, to make sure you're getting what you signed up for. Like that, that was kind of the approach we took. Uh, might be a bit basic. So I'm curious how the others approach it as well. Well, you've got somebody who's, who's, who's gone out on a limb, signed a contract based off of a promise that was made. And now you're trying to make it into reality. I think there's nothing wrong with you reaching out to that person, if this is a different person and saying, hey, by the way, that commitment you made to us that you paid us for, that you, you, that you, you paid, that your company paid money for, um, we're not able to help you get value if we don't get going here and we've got a block. Yeah, that yeah, reminds me, when, when we would follow up with that senior person, we would detail the steps very simply as what needed to be done. You know, it's like just letting you know, um, this is what we need to have happen. I know so-and-so is extremely busy, so I just want to make sure there is awareness that, that we need these things to happen in order for you to achieve what you signed up for. But but this also assumes, and, and I'm sorry, Chad, I'll let you out, but I, let, let me finish. This also assumes, yeah. though, that we've done, we, we've communicated that from the start. True. Right. We should be going Very into important. this saying, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Key yeah. stakeholder, by the way, once you sign, this is what needs to happen. And these yeah. are the things that I need your team to do. And these are the things that we're going to do. Mm-hmm. That's that's there's where the success plan becomes a key, key piece of information right out of the gate. Sorry, go ahead, Chad. Well, the only thing I was going to say is sometimes you have a new person that comes in and they're just like, well, that other person bought it. I don't care. So if it, if we waste the money that was on their, their end. Yeah. And um, some of the things that I've found to be helpful are it's almost like when the customer success team turns into like private investigators and they try and find out like who in their organization or who even in their customer base might know that person or someone, other people in that organization. And you try and get as much information as you can and the more information you have, then you can lever- leverage that. And so you can come at the person and say, okay, well, you know, um, I, you know I, I know that, you know, your company is maybe having these problems and that you don't have really a, a choice or something to that effect. You don't want to obviously do that, something like that, but you want to actually leverage the relationships. Like the best thing you can do is have another customer that knows that key contact that maybe is ignoring you and just say, listen, I see you guys are connected on LinkedIn. Can you reach out to that person and maybe just engage them and say that, this product will really help you in these areas. I really recommend that you start to engage and at least, you know, 
hear them out and then start to put a plan around it. So that's the thing. Like it doesn't have to be you, the one that's shouting at the, at the customer. You can have other people and leverage them. Yeah. yeah, for sure. And don't forget your sales partner. So yeah. they're incentivized Very likely fun. to have a comp plan. So bring them back in, yeah. um, make it an easy process for them to reach out and don't hesitate to leverage your resources. And one of the things that you and your sales partner should be also looking out for, especially during the sales process, are some of those uh, maybe middle managers or individual contributors that seem particularly interested, right? And, and, and when you spot those folks, right, uh, uh, start to establish a relationship with them. And while they may not be directly influencing the decision, they're, um, it's amazing to have those types of, those types of people you know, especially the boots on the ground that can give you some G2 on what's going on higher up, right? Um, yeah, just, just answering uh, Benny's question here yeah. in terms of how do you have that. strong yeah. decision makers interact with weak decision makers. And and so we actually, so one, one area is the community. So, you know, this is another scrappy project that we threw together. Uh, and, you know, it was something that the, my company wanted to do, but we weren't really sure how to do it. And then COVID hit and it would became really easy to say, all right, let's just do a Slack community. Let's start inviting people to that Slack community. And now we've put actually some more uh, bones around it. And we actually have the entire company engaged with it and putting content. Uh, it still needs some more work, but it's definitely better than it was. And we just experiment with it. And we, we do invite different customers in it. We Once a customer starts to ask a question, and we, that's what we do. We encourage them not just to go in there, but ask a question. And once they ask a question, then they see some of the more stronger participants answering those questions and, and they become more part of that community. One of the things actually we, we kind of stumbled on, which is pretty obvious, but worked really well, is that our head of product jumped in. It was that person's turn. And he, he did an AMA, like an ask me anything. And my CSM team was funny. What they did is they started reaching out to all of their customers and saying, go to the community and start asking questions of the head of products. And so we had all these questions that came in and we realized like that was like a really successful thing that we did. And maybe there's other AMAs that we can do with other people. It could be head of support. It could be myself. There's lots of things we can do there. Um, and then the other idea that I mentioned earlier was just doing like a really informal event. Um, you, I don't know. You can call it, um, you know, a clubhouse or something like that. I don't know. Not, not using the, the product clubhouse, but <laughs> the same, it's a similar thing. I mean, you're just getting people on a, on a call and, and just throwing out topics and, you know, what challenge do you have here? And, just getting these people to engage. I mean, theoretically, they should have more time. Nobody's traveling right now. Right. So if you get these people who are in the same area, you know, sometimes you can't do that. They might be competitors, but for the most part, you can get certain people on the line. They want to talk, shop and help each other and learn from each other. There's no other real way there's, that they're engaging with each other. So if you can help facilitate that, then you'll look like a hero. So yeah, if you have to get creative, we haven't done that yet. I'm, this is stuff that we're sort of, playing around with right now and trying to spin up. Love that. Um, cool. Can you hit done on that? Um, I, Ernesto asks, which key elements would you consider uh, that should be included in an action plan to reduce churn? Would you say that it's important to develop action plans that are segmented for different churn motives? Laura, you want to uh, want to jump in on that? Yes. So this is where playbooks come in. And this is really the definition of them. So what is the response to lower adoption of maybe a key feature? What is your response of less just signups? What is your response to um, frustration with features not being available yet or requests? I, th I think you've got to come up with individual action plans for the problem at stake and what your expected outcome. It's the same thing that you're doing at an overall standpoint with your client, but let's drill down to individual goals that are based on the data. Let's put actions for your CSMs. And you might be meaning six. And if I'm not answering that correctly, let me know. But that's how I'm thinking of it is that Actions are two ways, what you're going to do, and then actions, what your clients might be necessary to do and get their support on. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. Anybody else want to want to weigh in on that? I think it's a, it's pretty much. Okay. Excellent. Thanks, Ernesto. Uh, Savannah, it's a great question. Um, do you find it harder to create a strategic success plans with every client when each CSM has an overwhelming client load? 
how do you ensure the success plan doesn't fall off after the first quarter? Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to take a quick swipe of this because I'm a huge fan of success plans. You <laughs> don't create a success plan for every customer, right? You need to segment your book of business, just like your your company segments your your business, right? Success plans. And there are ways in which you can automate certain aspects of success plans, right? But you, you need to first dial in what a success plan is and, and focus on your larger customers with the biggest upside. Because that, that's really where you need, to, you need to focus that energy. Anybody else want to weigh in on that? I would agree yeah. with that. I mean, uh, yeah, that's, that's how we approach it as well. Yeah. yeah. And there are some interesting products that are coming out that uh, that can automate this. You can even do something simple as some uh, scheduled reports that send out a report on a monthly basis. It says here's here's your usage. Here's here are the. I mean, we're we're actually working on that for our own subscription, where we're sending to leaders. We're going to start sending to leaders on a monthly basis. Here's where your 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 team members are, how they're tracking in their learning plans and things like that. And that stuff is it's. You know, it's it's a low touch, and but but with our larger uh, clients, with our bigger logos, we're going to have a, a higher touch, of course, and we're going to have a success plan that we're going to keep updated. So it's just not realistic to do a success plan for everybody. Thank you uh, for that uh, for that question, Savannah. Laura, you uh, you uh, show that you want to answer uh, Sunanda's uh, question. How important are success tools for a CSM's day to day? And who makes that strategic decision? I think we've all talked about this, but I want to close it out. Start with your baseline and whatever spreadsheet tool to track the flows. If you have access to something else that gives your customer journey and your internal, your customer life cycle. But when it comes to strategic tools, and then on top of that, you need a source of truth. You've got a place. So whether once again, you're at a very small startup with low resources, and you are tracking what happens with a customer in a spreadsheet, fine. Just keep everyone towards that source of truth. And then you can build from there. I think what's most important to me is a CRM, a healthy CRM where calls, emails, everything's tracked so that as you scale as a company, you at least have that in place. And then you start adding the automation, potentially a CS tool and other key features. But Kelly and Chad, curious how you feel. Well, I'll just add to that, that, you know, when I first started building this team, I was very excited about tools because I was like, all right, tools solve problems, you know, but they don't, you know, tools are there to amplify what you've already got as a process. So starting small is, is definitely the best route, like starting with Google Sheets, if you're going very scrappy, you know, ultimately we, we ended up adopting Salesforce on the sales team and we took it in as, as customer success team as well. We, we didn't reach the gain site level yet. I, I viewed that as a, a slightly larger organization uh, opportunity, you know, and the, the rest of that question included like who makes the decision. I mean, I, I think your customer success person ideally is um, seen in a leadership role and, and does have the autonomy to make decisions about tools like that, but should get buy-in from the key stakeholders at your company and, uh, you know, articulate how, the tool itself would would benefit. And one of the major benefits I, I think a tool can provide down the road once you've got processes outlined and you're just using it to, to amplify that is reporting for senior executives, like ways to simplify and aggregate data. Um, but again, like garbage data in, garbage data out, like that old phrase is true. Uh, you you got to get all that stuff neat before you bring a tool in. Um, and, then, and then a tool can really help serve to, to aggregate and simplify. You just ask Kelly and Chad, you don't want my opinion, Laura? <laughs> now, you coached me on my opinion. So I think that's <laughs> do you have something to add? Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, it's, yeah. I, you know, I, I, I echo it all. You know, it's all about yeah. process, right? You've got to get the process down. The tool is an enabler, yeah. right? But you need to understand what it is you're, and what it's it not is just you're trying process. to do and, and measure, yeah. right? It's not, it's not just process, too. It's, it's on the people side. Like, yeah. you know, it's funny. I remember I had a discussion uh, with our, our head of finance. And I was like, because I was putting forward what I wanted. Um, and I newly brought to the organization and I was like, I need someone in ops that's going to help me here with this. And 
they're like, you don't want the tool. I'm like, no, I actually don't want the tool until I can secure an ops person. Okay. And, and that way I know I can be successful with the tool. Yeah. Um, and so that, that's just something in, to keep in mind as well. Yeah, that's, no, that's great. I love that. I don't want the tool. I want an ops person to help me figure out what it is we're trying to, what we're trying to do here with our customer. Then we'll enable, then we'll, then that tool will be rolled out to assist, right? Yeah. That I'll add that when, when I referenced Tableau earlier, we also had a, a person inside the company that was helping to create all the Tableau formulas, you know, query the data, uh, structure that. And it, it was my responsibility to lay out the vision, but they yep. definitely executed on, on building the frameworks for us. And data is your friend. And you need to be able to, as we've, we've referenced a number of times here, you want to be able to uh, be metering different things and, and, and exactly what those are, you may not know right off the right, right out of the gate, but you want to be able to start looking for patterns, right? And then when you you figure out, hey, I think I got a pattern here, like okay, let's measure those KPIs and let's figure, let's let's do another test, right? It's and, and you can get started if you start metering as much as possible, and then you get a data scientist in and have them start messing around with that data and looking at it and trying to figure out, hey, I think I see something here, uh, and, and it's amazing you can do that with historical data. But you got to have data to start with. Yeah. And you can do that before you have integrations. I know yeah. everyone is obsessed with getting the integrations potentially from HubSpot, Salesforce, to whatever CS tool. And sometimes not all the resources are available to make that possible. Yeah. That data scientist is a great way for them to pull the resources together. We use Data Studio, just like Tableau, um, in, in providing that type of reporting and multi-source um, roll-up picture. Yeah. Love it. Um, uh, Sadvi, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, Sadvi. Uh, Kelly wants to answer this. What are some other leading indicators of churn, contributing factors to calculating the health score of customers other than the ones that have been touched on, like surveys and usage data? Yeah, I'll take a first pass, and uh, I, I am going to re-highlight some things we already mentioned just to make sure that they were captured, which is you know, one of the biggest things for us was amount of time it took to hit the milestones we lined out. So if, if they were definitely late on um, what we considered the first time to value milestone, which, which for us was uh, integration, you know, uh, if, if they took longer than three weeks to integrate, that was a problem because three weeks was already kind of like a, a good amount of time to give them. Um, another one that ended up being huge over time was just not responding to emails with our CSMs um, or, anyone missing meetings, like large stakeholders or important stakeholders missing meetings. And that type of stuff, uh, it, it took me almost six, seven months to realize it wasn't always being escalated and was very important. Um, so, you know, allowing us a, a safe space too for your team to raise things like, hey, this customer, you know, someone didn't show up to this meeting or um, I'm not getting quick responses from a customer. I've always gotten quick responses from. That stuff is, is super valuable. And in my opinion, maybe the biggest indicator um, you know, there, we sort of split things in leading indicators and lagging indicators. Transaction volume for us was huge, but it's really a, a too late kind of indicator. Right. Um, whereas something like not responding to emails uh, was, was a much larger indicator. We, we found that we could identify early. Um, missing meetings, definitely huge. Um, and when that would happen, I would usually come in and, and take like a relationship building approach, which isn't always possible if you've got a lot of customers and you're low touch. But um, uh, for, for me, that was the strategy we had. I, I was getting on the phone with them and, and trying to build that up and I'd identify what's happening. Also, if you, have, if you have a more complicated rollout deployment, if you start seeing a pattern of, you know, commitments starting to be missed, I mean, one, one or two here is one thing, but if you see, yeah. start seeing this pattern of, hey, this, this individual, this group, this team is, keeps missing their commitments. That's mm -hmm. definitely a a leading indicator as well. Yeah. Another thing we haven't talked about, but it's something, another kind of weapon that I use on, on the tool front is something like Gong that records calls. And mm -hmm. um, it, what's really cool is that you can set it up so that it looks for certain keywords. And so, for example, I look for competitors as an example. We're in a pretty competitive space. We have some people that come from our competitors and, you know, we feel our product is better because it is. And it's fine if they've come and used a competitor, you know, in their previous life. But if that comes up, then that can trigger a whole different approach to make sure that we're working with that individual. And so they understand, you know, what are the key differentiators? And so that's just something that you can use as well. And the other cool thing about Gong, going back to uh, on the sales side, where, you know, you may be bringing in wrong fit customers, 
Gong keeps the sales team accountable too. So if there were something that was said in the sales process and the customer's like, well, this, this is what the salesperson promised, that we can go back and, and review those calls and try and verify what was actually promised during that time. I'm, I'm so curious, Chad, because we, we tried Gong and it was awesome on the sales side, like you just mentioned, but I found it overwhelming to, to really review content, even though, yeah, key, keywords being raised was great and Gong has some great analytic capabilities, but you know, I wasn't, and as a team, we weren't really going back and like re-reviewing calls in the way I, I thought we would. So we ended up just moving it over to sales only. So how, how are you effectively using that tool? Yeah, I mean, you, you kind of narrow it down, like you look for certain keywords uh, as a starting point. But the other thing is, I, I think of it as like almost like being a football coach, where I get to review certain calls of the team. I don't review all of them, but a few of them. And I like to hear, you know, how do they talk about the QBR? Like we, we spend time building this thing out. How are they talking about it? How are they asking the, cu- the customer certain questions? So if you, if you kind of look at it from that perspective, just on a few things and not like doing everything. And mm-hmm. then also, you know, maybe there was a, a call that was a tense call that we've heard about. Um, you know, then review it that way. And then lastly is um, I, I like to pull out certain things where we ask the customer, what's something successful you found from our product? So they like to take, tell us all the other stuff, but what's something successful? And so then we take that snippet and we actually share it with others in the company. Yeah. Um, yeah, so those are just that. things that we can do. Yeah. Nice. Excellent. Chad, I'd second that. That's exactly how I used it. I found it to help me remotely to be a, um, a manager and do play that player coach. I couldn't be on all phone calls. This is the opportunity where to take that. And I actually had a CSM lead initiative where we listened to each other's calls once a month and gave each other a round robin of feedback. And I was included in that, which was really helpful. The one thing I wanted to add that I think is very important in a year like last year is customer business health and what's happening in the industry in your churn reporting. Because forecasting for businesses like travel, like retail, that might be impacted by economic factors, um, don't forget that in your health scores because yes. you've got to be, be prepared to forecast the impact and potentially you not being a service that they need at a time where they're cost cutting across the board. Yeah, good point. Good point. Yeah, that's a good point. We've got, we got like five minutes and we got three questions. Let's see if we can get through them all. And this will be a first. Um, uh, so, uh, Chad, do you want to answer Eugene's question? Sure. I think Eugene was mentioning like for a lean startup that, you know, sales might be kind of owning, you know, different hats. And I think with a startup, you have to do whatever you have to do. Like you don't have a choice. Usually, you know, churn will tell you that there's a problem or, you know, the customer feedback will tell you there's a problem. And then that's when you have to change or, your team, like people are telling you they're a problem. If people are leaving your company because they're not happy, they have too much stuff on their plate, yeah. then you, know, you just have to look at those different factors and hopefully you get more funding and then you can determine like how you want to structure your team. Excellent. Anybody else want to add, add to that? Okay, cool. Chad, if you could get done there. Um, Steve, uh, it looks like Kelly wants to jump in on this one. Steve, for young companies that are just not ready for CS function. How would you recommend bringing that function into the org? Start with a leader like Laura first or Kelly or Chad and hire as you go. Also, how do you focus that small team's time early on? Firehose or focus on the largest customers first? I'll start with this, but then everyone else definitely chime in. Uh, for, for us at Orderful, we looked at it as necessary to have a player coach role. So when, when we thought about the idea of a leader, you know, it's a leader who's willing to roll their sleeves up um, you know, that was me. Like I, I also was actually joined the company in another role. We just realized real quick that we needed customer success. So I moved over internally to do it. And it was very much like, you know, handle everything as long as I can and then hire as needed. Um, and that, that seemed to work well. Um, and, and I think it's going to vary per organization and, and what your needs are. I mean, if you have the luxury of, of, scaling the team as the company grows, then, then that's great. Maybe that's not the case, but yeah, curious, Laura, like how, how it worked at your company, obviously SoftBank, much larger organization, but you basically had a startup within it. Sure. So I was brought in when I really am a solution delivery. So the product was already being sold and we went from a purchase to a robot as a service model, just to your, your traditional SaaS model. So I think when it comes to SaaS, when it gets, comes down to value and churn 
once you have people that no longer can manage that, whether it's from the product team, maybe doing the engineering and the, the launch of that, the sales team, I think it's good to have the product, the sales, some of those things ahead of the time. So that structure gets in place and the product has enough to actually create value and get customers, then I think the CS is kind of your next hire to to really deal with that reoccurring revenue, that retention of that and the success of it. Chad? Yeah, I, I don't think, I don't really have much to add. I think that, that's a yeah. good summary. Oh, well, uh, there's a second part to the question about how you focus the team's time, which is a great question. And I think this is, again, gonna vary widely per organization. Um, it, it, it would be a rare occasion that you got to have a super clean customer success org start from the beginning. Uh, in our case, major collaboration with, um, at the time, what we called implementation specialists who eventually ended up reporting to me. We just ended up continually shifting things within the, within the org to, to figure out what worked. Um, but it, when it was just me alone, um, it was definitely focused on the high value customers. Um, as soon as the implementation team started rolling up, we segmented um, and, and had lower tiers uh, and higher tiers and then thought about how, how to use their time. It was never a perfect science, though. We like continued to evolve it as we went um, and, and learned as we as we went what was going to be effective. And um, again, just all about fast onboarding for us. That was our biggest problem. So um, we we're essentially segmenting also by customers that were great at self-servicing versus not. And then the ones that weren't where they providing enough revenue to get the focus of the time is like a constant question we were asking. Makes sense. Um, cool. Thanks. Kelly, can you hit done there? Yep. And then do anybody have, we, we got one minute before I got to do the readout. Just like uh, another should, whole webinar. Yeah. Should, 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 I know. Should CSM be responsible for negotiating renewals and what is the potential impact? Oh, wow. Yeah. Building trust and advisory relationships. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah. My, my take is uh, yeah, you, uh, the CSM should not be negotiating renewals. They should be creating an environment for a renewal to happen, but the actual negotiation should be done by somebody else. Uh, but in some cases, it might be okay. So it really depends. Uh, you do, though, risk damaging your trusted advisor relationship if you are you go from advising to now negotiating. That's my take. I, I would just say that it could still fit under the customer success org, but not necessarily the same individual having having all those conversations. No, that's a good point, too. That's a model. The team that I just finished training has that exact model. Anything else, Chad, Laura? No, I've, I've drawn down notes myself, so I uh, appreciate the conversation. It was great. Excellent. Well, hey, listen, we're, we're, uh, we're at the end of the webcast. I think it went well, uh, but it's, uh, it's not what I think. Or it's not what my guests think. It's what all of you think. So please let us know by posting your feedback on LinkedIn and tagging either myself or success coaching or, any of my fantastic guests, I want to I want to thank you all for spending the time with us. Like I told you, I said I said we were gonna have a good conversation, right? And uh, we just got to get it started, right? I knew this from our from our prep call. So definitely appreciate the time that you've spent with us now and during the prep call, and for the ideas, thoughts, insights, best practices uh, that you share. One final note: great CSMs know that they can't. I'm sorry, great CSMs know that they don't have all the answers but they know where to get them. That's why we created CSM Mastermind to harness the knowledge and experience of the community to help improve everyone. So we hope you got something out of this discussion. We'll see you at our next event on May 19th when we'll discuss delivering value, something everyone should be focused on. Until we see you again, have a great rest of your day, week, month. Stay safe and stay healthy, everyone. Thanks, you guys. Again, thank you. Thank you. Great job.